Hello, and welcome to Engineering Ethics at NGIT. I'm your instructor, Daniel Estrada, and this is the lecture video for Lesson 4 on Conformity and Obedience. As always, these lecture videos will introduce the lesson themes and uh, readings. Uh, you can see all of these readings on Canvas at canvas.ngit.edu. Uh, you can also get access to these slides. So the theme for this lesson is Conformity and Obedience. In Lesson 3, the previous lesson, we introduced the Pinto case, and we looked at consequentialism, which is the first of the major ethical theories we'll be covering in this class. Instead of going on to a, another ethical theory, um, for this lesson, I want to look more closely at the Pinto case, and in particular at uh, Dennis Joya's uh, uh, article, Pinto Fires and Personal Ethics. Uh, Dennis Joya was the field recall coordinator at Ford in the early 70s, when the Pintos were on the road and burning up. Uh, as field recall coordinator, it was uh, Dennis Joya's job, along with his colleagues and, on his team, uh, to uh, evaluate the evidence uh, of these safety issues and make a decision about whether to issue a recall. The Pinto came before their team several times uh, in the early 70s uh, with uh, concerns about safety, and every time it came up, the team unanimously decided against issuing a recall. So in the early 90s, long, long after the Pinto controversy had, had blown over, uh, uh, Dennis Roya writes this article where he explains his decision at the time um, uh, why he made the choices that he did. Um, when he's writing this, uh, he's no longer working at Ford. Uh, instead, he's working uh, as uh, uh, an instructor at uh, University of Pennsylvania in the, in the business school. Um, he's teaching business ethics, um, and his business ethics students uh, uh, were grilling him about uh, the decision that he made while he worked at Ford and uh, going over the Ford case study. And he, so he wrote this article sort of to explain to his students why he made the decisions that he did. And in the article, he appeals... Uh, quite heavily to uh, very psychological uh, uh, facts about how people behave in large organizations. In particular, he refers to script schema. Um, but uh, uh, with this uh, motivation, uh, I also want to look in this lesson at um, uh, the psychology of conformity and obedience. If you've taken an introduction, psych, introductory psychology class, uh, you might be familiar with the Ash conformity experiment or the Milgram obedience experiment, which are uh, f famous psychological, uh, social psychology experiments in the 50s and 60s. Um, uh, very famous, very well known. Um, uh, if you don't know these, I'm happy to introduce them to you. Uh, we'll look closely at what these uh, experiments say about the psychology of conformity and obedience, uh, especially about um, how people respond to authority figures. Uh, Milgram's obedience experiment in particular was motivated uh, in response to uh, Hannah Arendt's um, uh, articles, essays on uh, the Eichmann trial in Jerusalem. Um, so we'll look a little bit at uh, Eichmann and uh, at our own, uh, NJIT's own Eric Katz uh, discussion of Nazi engineers. Uh, all right, but uh, to start, uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, just your responsibilities in a professional context. Um, simply because you have a job, you signed a contract, um, and simply because it's a professional context, uh, there are certain sort of expectations uh, and obligations that people have uh, for uh, appropriate behavior in a professional context. Um, some of this is pretty obvious enough. Uh, the, the book talks in chapter six, uh, t talks about these various uh, rights and responsibilities in a professional context, and uh, maybe the most straightforward one is collegiality. Um, how you uh, treat your colleagues, uh, and this should be pretty straightforward, that you treat your colleagues with respect, um, uh, that you are willing to cooperate with them, that you're willing to share a commitment to a, a shared project or a shared goal, um, that you're willing to uh, respect the people who work in, in your workplace, not just your uh, professional colleagues, but also like administration and staff uh, that uh, share your professional environment. Um, and, and also maybe an appreciation of how your work fits into the broader uh, social picture, um, into the professional community and the industry, um, but also into the larger social uh, milieu. Um, so, so I think it's pretty obvious that uh, th there's a basic obligation to treat your colleagues with respect. Uh, maybe slightly more difficult is something like confidentiality, especially for engineers who might have access to uh, sensitive uh, client information uh, or proprietary information uh, maybe patents or uh, special uh, design or techniques um, uh, in your firm or your, or bi your business, uh, 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 patents, trade secrets. Uh, so some of this information is protected by law, um, some of it is protected by professional courtesy, 
Um, there are uh, professional standards about how to keep uh, these trade secrets secret. Um, and there's uh, uh, often a expectation of a certain degree of confidentiality. Uh, so for me as an instructor, as a teacher, um, students are guaranteed a certain amount of confidentiality with their grades. I'm not allowed to post grades publicly. I'm not allowed to talk to uh, students about uh, each other's grades. Um, uh, and this is about student confidentiality. This is about uh, 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 res respect for the uh, student-teacher relationship. Um, and this is a responsibility I have as an instructor. Um, engineers might see similar kinds of uh, obligations in virtue of uh, being an engineer, in virtue of your professional role. Um, here's something maybe even more trickier, uh, respect for authority. Um, actually, let me see if I can do this. Uh, yeah, so uh, authorities, uh, the book defines as uh, uh, people who control resources or decision-making powers. So uh, authority here does not necessarily mean like a legal authority, like the police. Um, authority can be anyone who's in a position to make a decision. Uh, sort of uh, who's in a position to make an exclusive decision. Um, uh, so like your boss, you know, your boss might not have a badge or might not be a, a legal authority, but they might nevertheless be able to control certain resources or make certain kinds of decisions. And so they have a certain degree of authority over you. So the book distinguishes between two important kinds of authorities. Um, one is the authority uh, granted to experts or people with specialized uh, technical knowledge. Uh, or, or maybe just a, a particular experience, some, like an eyewitness. Um, but uh, 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 this kind of expertise um, uh, might give people a certain kind of authority in conversations or in decision-making process. Um, we saw this issue come up uh, when we were discussing the Challenger explosion uh, in the relationship between engineers and management, where management didn't have the technical engineering knowledge to know, uh, to fully understand or appreciate the risks uh, involved. Um, there's another kind of authority, though, that's not just expert authority, um, which is institutional authority. This is the kind of authority police and uh, politicians have, um, and this is maybe also the kind of authority that your, your boss has. So it might be that your uh, boss or your superior in your organization uh, is not an expert in your field, maybe lacks the expertise that you have, uh, but nevertheless that you're, that you're boss, that you're superior, and so you have to do what they say. And this is not because they know more than you in the sense of expertise, but it's simply because they have uh, an institutional role or an administrative role uh, that's uh, over yours and that gives, you, that gives them certain kinds of uh, control or decision-making power um, over you. Um, so uh, it's often the case that uh, experts uh, like engineers will have to be in situations where there are institutional authorities uh, making decisions that, that affect engineers, uh, but those decisions are being made by people who are not necessarily uh, engineering experts. Um, and understanding how to navigate these kinds of authority figures and what kinds of responsibilities you have to different uh, uh, professional roles and different authorities um, uh, is important and discuss more in the book. Um, but this also relates to a, a uh, another issue is somewhat related, which is the issue of loyalty. Um, so uh, you have some obligation to listen to authority figures because of their professional role, uh, because of their institutional position. Um, and you also have certain obligations uh, because of, for instance, contracts you've signed. Uh, maybe you have obligations simply because of the professional environment. Uh, but uh, uh, loyalty, so, so, so maybe that uh, requires a certain kind of loyalty. Uh, but sometimes loyalty is appealed to in a professional context uh, to get you to do things that maybe you shouldn't do from that professional standpoint, or maybe to get you to, think, to do things that you don't want to do, um, that maybe when you refuse to do something because you don't want to, or perhaps because you think you shouldn't uh, for legal or ethical reasons, uh, it, it, can, it can sometimes happen that uh, your employer or other people you work with uh, start to question your loyalty. Um, and so uh, it's important, I think, for engineers and other professionals just to think about the role that loyalty plays in a professional context. So if by loyalty we mean that you have an obligation to, fulfill, to fulfill your professional uh, duties, um, you know, contracts that you sign, if you've agreed, uh, you've, if you sign a contract to complete a certain task or uh, uh, see a certain project through to the end, then insofar as you sign that contract, then you have an obligation to fulfill that contract, um, to, uh, to keep to that commitment. Um, but this kind of loyalty, the loyalty of your professional obligations, um, it's important to understand that this, ob this obligation, uh, this kind of loyalty is uh, centered on actions 
um, on the consequences of your actions, you know, that you complete this task, the task that you agreed to. Uh, and it really doesn't have anything to do with your feelings or your motivation. So if someone wants you to complete a task and uh, you really don't want to do it, but you're professionally obligated, you know, you know maybe you signed a contract, but then uh, your your uh, friendship, you, you, you signed a contract with a friend, but then the friendship goes sour, but then you still have this contract and you, you have some obligation to fill that contract, but that doesn't mean you have to like it. That doesn't mean you have to uh, make up with your friend uh, uh, any more than sort of minimal professionalism requires. Um, sometimes... Uh, oh, yeah, it's also important uh, to remember that these contractual obligations are just one obligation among many obligations that you have, um, and it might be subordinate to certain obligations. Uh, for instance, the Paramount uh, Canon obligations uh, that we went over last time, uh, like uh, uh, holding the health, safety, and welfare of the public uh, Paramount. Um, this kind of uh, obligation might override an obligation that you have in a contract. If your employer asks you to do something that you know to be unsafe or illegal, um, even if you are contractually obligated to do what the person says, or to do what your client says or do what your boss says, um, if they're asking you to do something that's unsafe or illegal, uh, the contractual obligation might um, be invalidated. Um, you might have an obligation to uh, more important uh, duties like uh, uh, a respect for safety or respect for the law um, that render your contractual obligation uh, void. Now, I, I'm not a lawyer, so I'm not giving you legal advice here. Um, what I'm giving you ethical advice that maybe ethics um, requires that you uh, disobey your boss or or, diso or or violate your contract. Um, some companies um, make it a point to encourage employee uh, uh, positive employee attitudes. When I was in high school, I briefly worked for Walmart, and uh, before and after. Uh, shifts at Walmart, they would have the employees sort of gather around and sing songs together, um, sometimes uh, uh, give testimonials about why they like working for Walmart or how long they've worked for Walmart and sort of good feelings and uh, positive attitudes that they have towards Walmart. Um, it's important uh, for Walmart that they establish this kind of uh, positive culture uh, among their employees. And that's fine. Um, they can try to uh, uh, adopt that kind of workplace culture. Um, uh, maybe not everyone fits in that kind of uh, workplace environment. Um, your employer can ask that of you. Uh, and you know, maybe even it makes you a better worker to have these kinds of positive emotion towards your employer. Um, but it's typically not an ethical obligation. You're uh, typically not legally respons uh, required to enjoy your job or uh, act like you like your employer. Um, so uh, uh, this is just important in distinguishing different kinds of loyalty and understanding how an obligation to loyalty, what the obligation to loyalty actually demands of you. Okay, the book also goes over different kinds of professional conflicts that might arise. Uh, for instance, uh, conflicts of interest. And we'll talk a lot more about conflicts of interest in Lesson 7 when we go deeper into the Code of Ethics, where conflicts of interest come up uh, qu quite often. But a conflict of interest, uh, uh, in a general sense, is when uh, s someone in a professional role is pulled by competing obligations uh, in, in different directions. Uh, f for instance, um, I'm, a, I'm an instructor, uh, and uh, I, I have the responsibility of handing out grades um, so students sometimes want better grades than they've earned and might uh, try to bribe me. Um, this has uh, maybe happened uh, before uh, where students you know, offer me money or other kinds of gifts um, in order to get better grades in class. So on the one hand, um, I'm interested in money. Um, I like gifts. Uh, and so I have uh, some interest in listening to what these people are saying. Uh, but on the other hand, and the much more stronger obligation um, is my professional obligation uh, as a teacher, I have an obligation to give out grades fairly, um, to give out uh, grades uh, in a, a systematic and uh, non-biased way. Uh, this is uh, uh, both because of my obligation as a professional, but this is also my obligation to NGIT and the institution. Um, the institution has an obligation to its students also, and I'm a member of that institution. Uh, uh, and so accepting bribes, uh, accepting gifts uh, for grades, um, this would be a conflict of interest for me. Um, on the one hand, I have the interest of a, of a teacher, of a professional, to make sure the grades are fair. On the other hand, I have an interest in money uh, as a human being. Um, so uh, uh, because of this conflict of interest, uh, there's, I have a special responsibility as an instructor to not only not accept bribes and not accept gifts, uh, but to make it very clear to students that this is not acceptable. Um, uh, uh, to make it very clear that I uh, that 
um, this kind of behavior is not influencing my grading policies. Um, and what this means is that uh, maybe even gifts that seem harmless and that really aren't bribes, like for instance, a student who gives me an apple uh, after class, um, and they don't give me an apple after class because they want better grades. There's no kind of quid pro quo uh, exchange of uh, uh, favors going on. They just give me an apple after class. Uh, so can I accept that apple? Well, it seems harmless. It's a very low value item, and there's no promise of grades in return. But on the other hand, if other students see that I'm getting this apple after class every day, uh, the other students might come to believe that I'm playing favorites with certain students over others. Uh, they might come to believe that certain students are getting uh, a, a positive grade result from these constant gifts. So even in the situation where I'm not accepting a bribe, where I'm you know, just getting an apple because I'm a teacher, and that's sometimes what students do, um, even in this situation, I have an obligation as a teacher to not accept that gift and to make it clear to the rest of the students that I'm not uh, uh, playing favorites among the students. Now, that might not seem fair. Uh, you might think, well, it's just a harmless apple. And uh, maybe in a general, in a normal situation where I'm just a person, uh, you know, in, in a park or something, uh, uh, that, that, there, that this kind of uh, taking a, a apple as a gift is harmless. But this isn't just a normal situation. This is a professional context where I have a special social, uh, I have a special professional role as an instructor, as someone who's in charge of giving out grades. If the students come to think that my grade uh, assignments aren't fair, um, this represents a conflict of interest, um, even if I'm not technically doing anything unethical. Um, okay, we'll talk more about conflicts of interest, especially in an engineering context um, in Lesson 7. Um, the book also talks about other kinds of conflicts, though, uh, conflicts between um, experts and institutional authorities, like the manager and the engineer in the uh, Challenger Explosion uh, case. Uh, put on your, take off your engineering hat and put on your management hat. Um, also, uh, uh, just the conflicts we've already discussed uh, between different obligations that an engineer might have. Um, and uh, in order to resolve these kinds of conflicts, the book uh, has several suggestions for creating an ethical workplace. And the important point here is that an ethical workplace is not simply a place where everyone does the right thing. I mean, it's important to do the right thing, but in some sense, it's not enough to sort of merely do the right thing. Um, what's important is that you create a culture uh, that encourages people to do the right thing, um, that uh, orients uh, the entire workplace environment um, towards... Uh, sort of pro-social uh, 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 workplace positive um, um, actions. Uh, so, so for instance, uh, when uh, management tells employers to do one thing or act one way uh, for ethical reasons, but then the managers themselves act a different way, um, this is the kind of thing that can create an uh, unethical workplace, a workplace where uh, empl employees don't take seriously the ethical guidelines. Right? If the management isn't taking seriously the ethical guidelines, then why should the employees? I mean, maybe they'll get in trouble, but it becomes clear that if the management doesn't really believe it, then the employees are, are less motivated to follow along. Right? Top management has to set a, a, the, the tone for the organization, um, not just in words, um, not just in policies that infect employees, but by personal example. Um, if you show that the management is themselves, are themselves concerned about the ethics, then the employees will tend to follow the example. Um, acknowledging the complexities of ethical conflicts, um, acknowledging the difficulty in addressing ethical conflicts is r really important in uh, establishing a workplace culture that takes ethics seriously. Um, if, uh, if you don't have procedures set up, if you don't make it a point to emphasize the importance of ethics, then ethics becomes one of those things that people tend to blow off, people tend to not take seriously, and you end up with an ethical, uh, w with, with a workplace that uh, tends to disregard ethics. Um, one, one thing to help with this ethical workplace, uh, with the construction of an ethical workplace, is uh, by building explicit procedures for conflict resolution, like when there is a problem, how do you deal with that problem. Um, and the book uh, gives a few suggestions on how to manage workplace conflicts. And this is uh, sort of good advice for a professional context. This is also good advice just generally. Uh, people are very complex. Uh, conflicts tend to happen. Um, conflicts as a result of uh, personality conflicts that some people just don't like each other, just don't get along well. Uh, maybe also personality, con uh, maybe also uh, conflicts over mistakes that people make, um, and you know uh, people try to throw throw the blame around. Uh, so these kinds of situations where there are interpersonal conflicts are extremely common in all areas of human life. And understanding how to uh, approach uh, situations of conflict um, in ways that de-escalate 
uh, to, that de-escalate tensions, um, that bring everyone together uh, to uh, resolve the conflict and uh, sort of move forward uh, is very important for ma managing any kind of social interaction, um, including in a professional context. So uh, one of the recommendations the book has is uh, to get people's ego out of the uh, resolution. So um, uh, sometimes uh, there are problems that are not the re not because of people, but nevertheless people get blamed. Um, sometimes there are problems that are the result of people, and that uh, it's it's certain people that are the cause of certain problems. Uh, nevertheless, addressing these kinds of conflicts and re resolving them and moving on from the conflicts um, often requires uh, not addressing the people involved uh, or not addressing the positions of the people involved or the sort of cliques and uh, uh, groups that form uh, as a result of the conflict, but instead focusing on the problems that uh, result from the conflict, um, the particular, uh, the, the concrete facts of the situation that need to be resolved. Um, instead of focusing on the people, focus on the problem. Instead of focusing on the egos or the positions involved, focus on the interests at stake. Right? Uh, uh, what's at stake? Um, who? Uh, uh, what are the consequences of this conflict? Um, and uh, what will it take to get resolved? Um, um, focusing on the resolution to the problem instead of the people involved with the problem uh, tends to. Uh, when you focus on people, people tend to get defensive. Um, uh, that tends to heighten the conflict and um, uh, uh, break down uh, progress. So focusing on problems and uh, what's at stake uh, helps. Um, if you, especially if you're in a management position, uh, when making a decision, um, instead of just saying what the decision is, maybe present a couple of options, present possibilities, um, include people in uh, formulating those possibilities, and uh, make sure that everyone who has a stake in the conflict um, is involved in the decision-making process to resolve it. Um, getting people involved in the resolution to a conflict is how you get that con that resolution to be accepted by that group. Um, if uh, people feel like someone's just making a decision and telling them what to do, then uh, conflicts don't tend to get resolved, they tend to just fester. Um, but if people feel involved with the resolution process, if people feel involved in, uh, in fixing the problem, then those problems tend to stay fixed or tend to uh, hold up better. Okay, so those are just um, some uh, bits of advice. M maybe this is useful to some people. Um, let's go ahead and go on to uh, Dennis Joya. Uh, if you want to talk about any of that stuff in the discussion forum, I I'd be happy to hear your thoughts. Uh, so, so Dennis Joya, um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, Dennis Joya was a field recall coordinator at Ford from 1972 to 1975. Um, and uh, he, he writes the article uh, Pinto Fires and Personal Ethics in the 90s, in 1992, um, several decades after he worked at Ford. So he hadn't worked at Ford for a very long time. In the uh, time in between, Dennis Ray actually went back to school and got a PhD in psychology, um, which is where a lot of his research in this article comes from and uh, sort of motivates his uh, turn to business ethics um, uh, later in his career. So in this article, which he's uh, writing to some extent to his students to explain his decisions back in the 70s, um, the article starts, and in this sense, it's kind of a mea culpa. It's sort of a, a, an apology for making these bad decisions uh, when he was field recall coordinator. So the article starts with some discussion of Dennis Joya's background um, and especially his uh, college career. Um, he describes himself, oops, uh, he described himself as a child of the 60s. Um, he says he was an anti-war protester and he was very unhappy with uh, business culture and sort of capitalism. Um, as a college student, he says he wore his hair long. Uh, he was sort of a, a, a counterculture or anti-establishment anti uh, sort of uh, student in, in college. So his friends were all very surprised when he ended up accepting a job at Ford. And he reasoned at the time, he told his friends, that he would have a better job changing the corporate culture from the inside uh, than he would as a protester um, in the street. So Dennis Joya thought that he had a strong moral center, that he had a strong s sense of ethics, and that he could go into the business world and make it m a more ethical place. But in, in the article, Dennis Reyes says that he quickly realized that uh, the company was changing him more than he was changing the company. Um, the job he describes is very competitive. 
uh, that it was uh, fast paced and that uh, he had a lot of opportunity to sort of get ahead and uh, make himself known. And what that required more than anything else is adopting the corporate culture, adopting the attitudes of the corporate environment. Um, so he describes very shortly after uh, getting into Ford uh, that he cut his hair short, um, that he was uh, more and more looking at things from the perspective of the business and you know what's good for Ford. And he's looking at things less and less uh, as he did in college. So his, uh, his uh, expectation that he would uh, maintain the strong moral center and use that to change the company was quickly shown to be false, um, sort of naive. Um, and uh, then he describes uh, the Pinto case, um, uh, facts that we mostly are already familiar with from last week. Uh, and uh, he explains why he made the decision to not issue a recall. Um, he... Uh, mentions that he was personally uh, upset, um, emotionally upset, when he was looking at some of the evidence coming back uh, about the Pinto crashes, right? Seeing the pictures of these burned out cars, uh, seeing pictures of the people who were caught inside these cars um, as they burned. Um, he said that it made him, uh, it, it, like it, it touched him emotionally. Um, it, he, say, he talks about uh, not being able to sleep at night, worrying if he was making the correct decision on some of these um, uh, uh, on some of these uh, uh, recall cases. Um, and he talks a lot about how it was originally affecting him uh, very deeply emotionally. Uh, but then eventually, in order to do his job well, he says it required a certain muting of emotion that he couldn't um, he couldn't. Uh, have a bleeding heart and care emotionally about every one of these cases because there was just too many of them and doing the job well required sort of processing them in a, uh, a very sort of systematic way according to the interests of the company and not really according to his own emotional uh, feelings. Like if, if he became emotionally upset at every recall case and wanted to issue a recall, then he wouldn't have his job for very long because that's not what the company wants. Right, the company doesn't want someone who wants to issue a recall every time. They want someone who's going to make the decision to issue a recall uh, only when it's necessary. And for uh, uh, Dennis Joya, um, um, there was a script that he was following to determine whether it was necessary to recall uh, the Pintos. Um, the script was that uh, either the case had to have a high frequency of occurrence or it had to have directly traceable causes. He says, I had little time for con uh, speculative contemplation on potential problems did not f that, did, that did not fit a pattern that suggested known courses of action leading to a possible recall. Right, so he couldn't just recall everything. He had to recall things according to a procedure. And the procedure was, um, if there are enough cases, if there's a high frequency of occurrence, or if you know what the problem is, then you issue a recall. And Dennis Joy said, the Ford, didn't, uh, the, the Ford Pinto didn't meet these conditions. Uh, for one thing, there were very few uh, instances of uh, crashes. Um, there were fewer than uh, w the threshold for issuing a recall. And second, uh, they weren't aware yet of the um, part failure in the gas tank. So there, there weren't directly traceable causes yet that Dennis Joya was aware of um, that required the kind of recall uh, that he was uh, uh, able to make. So. So he has a procedure, uh, he has a checklist. Um, the, the Pinto comes up for recall several times, but it doesn't meet the checklist, and so he doesn't issue the recall. He feels bad about the patients. He, he, he recognizes that there's something sort of grotesque about these car crashes, but nevertheless, it doesn't meet the script, and so he doesn't issue a recall. Um, he explicitly says that he's uh, apologetic for this, or that he thinks he made the wrong decision. He regrets it. Um, he says at the time he was he was convinced that he had made the right decision in not recommending a recall. In light of the times and the evidence available, I thought I had pursued a reasonable course of action. But then he says, more recently, I've come to think that I really should have done everything I could to get those cars off the road. Um, so uh, he was following the script. Um, he was doing his job, he thought. Um, and uh, Dennis Ray spends a lot of time in this article explaining how difficult the job is and uh, 
I, again, to sort of empathize with uh, him and the decision that he made. Um, so I'm just going to read this section from the from the article. He says, It's difficult to, to convey the overwhelming complexity and pace of the job of keeping track of so many active or potential recall campaigns. It remains the busiest, most information-filled job that I've ever worked, or I've ever held or would want to hold. I distinctly remember that the information processing demands led me to confuse the facts of one problem case with another on several occasions because the telltale signs of recall candidate cases are so similar. Uh, I thought of myself as a fireman, a fireman who per perfectly fit the description by one of my colleagues. Um, in this office, everything is a crisis. You only have time to put out the big fires and spit on the little ones. By those standards, the Pinto problem was a distinctly little little one. He says, I do, however, remember being disquieted by a field report accompanied by graphic, detailed photos of the remains of a burned out Pinto in which several people had died. Um, although th that report became part of my file, I did not flag it as any special case. It's also important to convey the muting of emotion involved in the recall coordinator's job. I remember contemplating the fact that my job literally involved life or death matters. I was someone responsible for finding and fixing cars now because someone's life might end up uh, might depend on it. I took it very seriously. Early in the job, I would sometimes w w wake up at night uh, wondering whether I'd covered all the bases. Had I left some unknown person at risk because I had not thought of something? That soon faded, however, and of necessity, the consideration of people's lives became a fairly r removed, dispassionate process. To do the job well, there was little room for emotion, he says. I'm just continuing on, uh, reading another quote. He says, Organizational culture, in one very powerful sense, uh, amounts to a, collective, uh, a collection of scripts writ large. Um, did I sell out? Were my cognitive structures altered by salient experience? Without question. Uh, scripts for understanding and action were formed and reformed in a relatively short time in a way that not only altered perceptions of issues, but also the likely actions associated with those altered perceptions. So what Dennis Joya wants to argue is that the reason he made the decisions that he did was because he had adopted the organizational culture and in particular the organizational scripts, um, the scripts for telling him what to do and what not to do. Um, his psychological research is also on these scripts, or so-called script schema. Uh, yeah, here we go. Um, so uh, script schema are um, patterns of behavior, um, uh, sequences of behavior uh, 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 that tell you what is appropriate or inappropriate in a given situation. So we all follow scripts. Um, and to some extent, we can't operate in social life without following scripts of some sort or other. Maybe the easiest script to recognize is the script you follow when you're uh, ordering food at a fast food restaurant or a... Uh, at a table at a, at a fancy restaurant. So there's a procedure for how it goes, right? You, you say one thing, you know, the, the cashier says, uh, can I take your order? And then you give your order, um, and then they uh, check your order to make sure, and then you exchange money and so on. There's a, a regular procedure for how that goes. Um, there are things that are appropriate or inappropriate to do at every step of that procedure. And the reason you can do this effectively is because both you and the cashier who's working at the fast food place, uh, you both know the script. And so you can just jump right into the script, uh, even though you don't know each other, right? So, I mean, usually human interactions involve people you know, like friends, relatives, uh, co-workers. Um, but the person at the fast food counter, unless you go there all the time, is, is someone you probably don't know, you probably haven't spoken with, and you really don't have a reason to trust uh, because you have no history with the person. Um, However, you both uh, share uh, not just a background culture, but you, you share the script for ordering at the counter, right? And so uh, because you both know the script, you can engage in this pattern of behavior with the person that you don't know otherwise. And because you both know the script, that also confers a certain amount of trust, right? Because they know the script, you know, and, and they're you know, wearing the uniform and everything. Uh, 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 this means that they're the right person to handle your, your food. Um, so we all understand uh, how these scripts work. Um, we also... Uh, so one of the useful things about these scripts is not only that it sets the context for these social interactions, but it's also very easy to recognize and address violations of the script. So if I go up to the fast food uh, person and you know they ask me what I, I would like to order, and I start telling them about my day, I'm telling them about my dog, I'm asking about their pets, um, uh, you know, that's the f a sort of fine thing to do with a friend. There's nothing uh, wrong whatsoever talking about that stuff with a friend, but that's not what you're supposed to do in general with the person at the lunch counter, especially if you don't know them, right? Uh, so that violation of the script, it's not that you did something socially inappropriate. Um, it's, it's just that you did some, something inappropriate to that, uh, that script context. Um, and so if someone starts talking about their day and about their pets and so on at the, at the, at the fast food counter, um, it, it might become a little bit awkward. It might become a little bit weird. You might want to know what they're doing and wh why they're talking about 
uh, about those things. And uh, the reason that it becomes awkward, the reason we're so very sensitive to this is because psychologically we operate on these scripts. The scripts help us navigate these complex social situations by making them a matter of routine procedure. Uh, one uh, reference that we've already ran into uh, along these lines is uh, in the David Foster Wallace commencement speech where he talks about the natural default setting and uh, what it's like to run on autopilot. Um, so scripts, one of the benefits of scripts is that it sort of allows us to run an auto autopilot. Uh, we don't have to think too hard about the details of our social interaction because the script uh, is doing most of the work in uh, moving that interaction along. So you, you might think in, in this lesson uh, a little better just about how scripts work. Um, for Dennis Joya, uh, what he wants to say is that he had adopted sort of wholesale the script from the company about what when and where you issue a recall, like under what conditions you issue a recall. And the script told him to think one way. And notice, importantly, that uh, the script that he was following from the company went against his own personal moral conviction, or at least this is what he says, that, uh, that his own moral, his own gut, his own moral uh, intuition was telling him that there was something wrong with the Pinto case. But the script from the company was saying that, no, this is not, uh, this is not a big problem. And so uh, he ended up siding with the uh, corporate script rather, rather than his own uh, uh, internal moral sense. <coughs> um, uh, so I want to talk a little bit about the ethics of listening to the script, or just sort of just following a script, or just doing your job. Um, and I will talk about that a little bit. Uh, this is sometimes called the Nuremberg defense, or just, just following orders, or superior orders. Uh, the idea that well, it was just you're just doing your job. Uh, how can I be responsible for just doing my job? The real problem here was the job, right? The corporate culture that was giving me the script. Right, the script was bad. But uh, Dennis Roy is arguing that it's not entirely um, his fault or his responsibility because he was just doing the job that was sort of handed, handed to him. So I, I want to talk more about this, uh, this idea of just following orders, you're just doing your job. But uh, first, I want, to, I want to spend a little bit more time on thinking about the psychology here. So Dennis Droya says that uh, part of the explanation for his decision was that he was following the scripts of his, uh, of his, of his of the corporation. Um, and maybe to some extent he's right, uh, but maybe there are other psychological factors at play. Uh, for instance, uh, conformity and obedience. So I have a couple of videos here you might want to watch. Um, so this, is, uh, this is a video. It says Pruden a video from Prudential, but this is because Prudential owns the uh, copyright to the video. It's not because Prudential produces. This is uh, from an old um, uh, a hidden camera. Um, hidden camera was like a TV show in the 50s where they would play pranks on people. And one of the pranks they played was this elevator prank where everyone stands in the elevator backwards. So the guy doesn't know that there's the, uh, the camera watching him. Um, he's just getting in the elevator thinking that it's an elevator. Um, but everyone's standing in it the wrong way. And what you see is that he eventually turns around the other way. And uh, the hidden camera thing here does this a couple of times. Uh, so there's the other guy in the elevator. Um, you can listen to the actual audio from the video, but I'm just going to talk over it. Yeah, so this is the guy, um, and then there's people coming in. So the people coming into the elevator, these are all confederates of the experiment. Um, these are people who are playing along with the hidden camera thing. So they're, they're doing this deliberately. Most people don't stand in the elevator that way. But uh, if you tell a few people to go stand in the elevator that way, then anyone else in that elevator will likely turn around also. Um, it's, uh, uh, it's, uh, so this is conformity. This is conformity to a, a peer group. When you're in a context, you tend to play along with what other people in that context are doing. Uh, when in Rome, you do as Romans do. Um, so uh, when you're in the elevator and everyone's standing one way, I mean, you know, maybe maybe they do something strange in this building where they uh, there's an elevator culture that does something different. So so when you're in this building and you're in their elevator, you maybe play along with their uh, social rules. Um, seems straightforward enough. Uh, there's a more elaborate. Oh no, oh no. Uh, maybe maybe I won't be able to show that video. I'll, I'll see if I can repair that that link. Um. um uh, but uh, these kinds of experiments are not just sort of pranks that are fun on TV. Uh, they actually have a, a psychological basis. So back in the 50s, um, uh, uh, Solomon Ash was a, a psychologist, and he ran these famous set of uh, social psychology experiments uh, called the, the Ash Conformity Experiments, um, which was uh, designed to test how susceptible we are to listening to our peers. The important part of the conformity experiments is that these are, uh, this, is a, a peer, this is basically peer pressure. 
Um, the, there's no um, authority relationship between you and the other people involved. The people in the elevator are just, just other people. But because uh, there's this sort of social pressure to conform to your social environment, um, you end up conforming to those peers. So the Ash Conformity Experiment, uh, the, the task involved uh, uses these uh, lines. So line A, B, and C, you get a bunch of people in a room, and you ask them, of the line here, which line does it match? Um, and you might be able to tell from just looking at this for a second that line A is too short, line B is too long, and line C is the correct length. Uh, is is like that matches this card, so uh, it's not too hard to see if you have uh, decent vision, uh, you can pretty easily estimate which is the correct line and which are the the wrong lines. Um, but the uh, the trick of the Ash conformity experiment is that you get a bunch of people in here to answer these questions, but most of the people are confederates of the experiment. They're playing along with the experiment, and they're pr uh, they're uh, they're all uh, coordinated to give the wrong answer some of the time. So, uh, so in this experiment, uh, this guy is the subject of the experiment. We're seeing whether he conforms, and everyone else is part of the experiment, and uh, they all start giving... So the, uh, we start out, everyone's giving the right answer, but eventually people start giving the wrong answer. Everyone says B, for instance, and they all say B uh, uh, together, like, like as a unified B, 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 and then the person is looking at it is like, uh, that looks like C. So uh, the question is, do they conform? Do they say B? which is the wrong answer, but it's the answer that everyone else is giving, or do they give the right answer? And what uh, Solomon Ash found, uh, this is uh, uh, some footage uh, uh, of, of the experiments. You can, you can watch them um, do a couple of versions of this. Uh, what Solomon Ash found is that uh, most people give the correct answer. When you, when you put them in this situation, most people will ignore what the other people say and give the correct answer. About 63% of participants gave the correct answer. Um, on these cards, um, but a sizable minority um, uh, will give an incorrect answer um, yeah, so a sizable minority will uh, answer with the confederates of the experiment and give the incorrect answer um, and uh, uh, s s some of the time, and at least 75% of the participants gave at least one correct, inc uh, one incorrect answer. So uh, most people answered the correct answer most of the time, but 75%, so a majority, would give at least one incorrect answer that conformed with the group. So there's some small uh, pressure to conform with the group at least some of the time, and 75% of the participants at least once gave into the group. Um, very few always conform, 5%. Um, most conform sometimes. 25% um, are stubborn nonconformists and, and never gave the wrong answer. Um, or never gave, gave the conforming answer. Um, uh, one of the interesting things about Solomon Ash's experiment is uh, the investigation into why people conform or don't conform. Um, there's different reasons. Uh, so some people conform uh, because they don't want to stand out from the crowd. They don't want to, like, be different from everyone else. Um, but sometimes people give the wrong answer because they uh, doubt themselves. They, they think, well, if everyone else gave the different answer, then maybe I'm wrong about something. Maybe I'm seeing it wrong. Maybe, I, maybe my eyes aren't working. Maybe there's something wrong with me. So uh, uh, there's some people, they just don't want to stand out from the crowd. But some people sort of generate a kind of uh, self-doubt. Um, uh, another thing that's very interesting is if uh, if one other person of the Confederates does not conform, if one other person in the group uh, of people playing along uh, gives the correct answer, then almost no one conforms with the group. Right? If someone else is on your side giving the correct answer, then you'll give the correct answer too. Um, you're very likely to give the correct answer. Um, if you have someone on your side, you're more likely to give the correct answer against the group. But uh, when... Uh, when all the group is marching in lockstep, then people are more likely to conform to the group. When there's any deviation in the group, people are less likely to conform. This is why it's important to speak out about things, even maybe things that you think are obvious, um, because chances are that other people recognize the things that you th think are obvious, but they're not saying anything because no one else is saying something. So when you speak out, um, you make it more likely that other people will speak out also.
Um, when the pressure to conform goes away, uh, you might have seen this here, uh, this, this last version experiment, they have the person write down their answers on a piece of paper instead of announcing them to the group. Everyone else announces it to the group. And so uh, you don't have to show everyone else how you're voting or how you're answering the, the question. And so because you don't have to show everyone else, uh, you tend to not conform. Um, the conforming behavior, it's really a social performance for the other people in the group to show them that you're part of that group. Right? So if there's uh, differences in the group, then you're less likely to conform because you can still be part of the group and, and, uh, and answer differently from them. Right? But if all of the group is marching in lockstep, then you tend to conform uh, in order to not be uh, uh, out of that group. Okay, so, so this is interesting, and uh, you will see, in, even in professional contexts, um, how conformity influences the kinds of decisions people make, um, the way people decide together. Um, uh, one of uh, uh, Solomon Ash's uh, students, uh, Stanley Milgram, um, uh, uh, in the early 1960s, um, developed uh, an elaboration of this experiment. Um, he, this is called the obedience experiment. The important thing about the obedience experiment is that it's not a peer situation. You're not just responding to peer pressure in the obedience experiment, but you're responding to authority. The obedience experiment is about how likely people are to listen to an authority figure. So this, uh, if you know this experiment, um, uh, it's a lot of fun. Uh, they don't conduct this experiment very much anymore because uh, it's very traumatic to the people that they're conducting it on. But uh, 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 th this is the uh, electric shock experiment. Um, importantly, there are no shocks actually given in the experiment. So the, the trauma here is not from being shocked too much. Uh, no shocks are actually administered in the experiment. Um, there's no shocking going on in the experiment. But uh, someone is, uh, gets, uh, there's, uh, there's a, a fake shock. Uh, someone pretends to be shocked. Um, like an electrical an actual shock. Um, someone pretends to be shocked, and the question is, uh, how much are people willing to shock the person uh, that they think is being shocked? So, uh, so the setup is, is uh, similar to the Solomon Ash experiment, where um, there are confederates to the experiment. There are people playing along. So, in the experiment, there are three roles. There's the experimenter, the teacher, and the learner. So in the experiment, the experimenter and the learner are both confederates of the experiment. They're both part of the experiment uh, setup. And the subject of the experiment, the one that we're experimenting, is the teacher. The teacher is the subject of the experiment. So uh, we're, we're looking at what the teacher does. Um, the experimenter and the learner are supposed to behave the same way every time Every time they run the experiment. So the, the real variable here is what the teacher does. and uh, uh, And... Uh, but the teacher doesn't know that it's only them that's being experimented on. The teacher thinks the learner is also being experimented on. And uh, at the beginning of the experiment, they actually uh, uh, do like a, uh, a drawing of straws to see who's the teacher and who's the learner. And it's set up so that the teacher is always the teacher. But um, but the teacher thinks that the learner might, might have been the teacher or vice versa. So uh, the teacher doesn't, re doesn't really know what's going on. And the, but the teacher is told by the experimenter. The experimenter, uh, this is an experiment at Yale. The experimenter is a professor at Yale and uh, is wearing a lab coat and, and so on. Um, and the experimenter tells the teacher that here's the experiment. The experiment is to study the effects of shock um, and uh, negative feedback uh, and, and, and uh, sort of punishment. Um, uh, the effects of shock on uh, learning. So the goal here is to learn a set of words or a set of word pairs. And... Uh, uh, so the learner is supposed to learn these word pairs, and the teacher uh, reads out to the learner what the word pairs are, uh, or what one of the word pairs are. It gives, it's a multiple choice question, and the learner answers the multiple choice question, uh, and then the teacher uh, determines whether the answer was correct, and if it was not correct, the teacher is supposed to administer a small shock. Um, um, the shocks start off low, but the teacher is told to increase the intensity of the shock, so it starts off at like 200 volts, and it goes up to 450 volts. Um, and so the shocks get more and more intense uh, as the learner makes mistakes. Uh, again, no shocks are actually being administered. The machine is not a real shocking machine. Um, uh, what they do is they set the learner up. They, they sort of strap the learner into the machine, uh, and then they take the teacher into a different room. Um, and then once the teacher's in a different room, everything from the learner is a pre-recorded uh, audio track. So all the screaming and, and stuff is from the learner 
uh, pre-recorded uh, to make the sounds and uh, to, to scream um, more and more violently. Um, and the question is, uh, as the learner keeps making mistakes and the teacher keeps giving shocks, how far will the teacher go to continue giving shocks? I mean, in particular, will the teacher go all the way to the 450 volt shock? Uh, so the way that the experiment runs is that at first, so uh, as the learner is getting strapped in, the teacher is watching, and uh, uh, the only shock that's ever administered in the uh, experiment is that they actually shock the, t the teacher just to show the teacher that there is a shock. And it feels a little bit like if you ever put your tongue on a battery, um, sort of like a little, uh, a little jolt. Um, it, it might hurt if it's done for a long period of time, but it's sort of a little shock is just a little shock. Uh, <laughs> so, they, so they shock the teacher, so the teacher's convinced that there is a shock going on, and then they strap the learner in. Um, the learner uh, mentions as they're being strapped in that they have a heart issue, that they had recently seen a doctor about a heart issue, and the doctor had told them to not engage in any strenuous activity because it might uh, exacerbate the heart problem. Um, the experimenter says to this that, oh, the shocks are very, uh, they're not dangerous, they're very light, uh, it shouldn't be any problem, uh, uh, so, so, so don't worry about it. And then they bring the teacher into the other room, uh, and then they have the teacher start reading off these questions to the learner to see if the learner can uh, get the correct answer. And every time the, there's an incorrect answer, you have to shock the, uh, the learner. Um, so the teacher starts going up. Um, as the shocks uh, get more and more severe, um, the learner starts uh, screaming, uh, saying, ow, uh, it hurts. Eventually, the learner starts saying, uh, OK, I'm done. Stop, stop the experiment. I want out. Um, I want to leave the experiment. It's hurting. Um, and then the learner starts complaining about their heart, that my heart's hurting me. The doctor said I shouldn't do anything that's strenuous that's going to hurt my heart. Um, I, I want the experiment to, to, to be over. I, I want out. Um, eventually, uh, eventually the, the, uh, the learner uh, just starts screaming uh, in pain, um, like not stopping screaming, just keeps screaming in pain. And then afterwards, the learner just stops uh, all communication. Uh, it's completely silent. Um, so the teacher doesn't know what happened. Maybe the learner died. Maybe the learner passed out from pain. Uh, the teacher doesn't know. Uh, but the question is, how far will the teacher go to continue shock a person who doesn't want to be shocked, who's objecting to the shock to the experiment? Um, uh, when Milgram formulated this experiment, um, uh, he estimated that maybe 10% of, uh, of teachers will actually administer the final shock. Um, he sent around a survey to his colleagues and his uh, graduate students about what they thought. They also thought there was less than a 10% chance. Some people thought it was less than a 1% chance. Like, how could you keep administering a shock to someone who's yelling, please stop, I want out? Stop, stop, stop. So uh, all of the psychologists thought that n no one would go through with the shocks. Um, in fact, when you run the experiment, um, something like 65% of the people will continue shocking the patient uh, past the point where they're passed out um, and all the way to the final shock. Final 450 volts. 65 percent of people will uh, continue uh, giving the shock. Um, now, the, again, the experimenters thought that no one would, would do it, but they had a uh, uh, script set up uh, for um, addressing objections that the teacher might have. So, if the teacher ever s stopped and was like, you know, maybe we shouldn't do this, um, the experimenter, and this is with the experimenter's role, was to get the teacher to keep going. So, the teacher might object and the experimenter would say, please continue with the experiment. Um, eventually, the teacher would say, or the experimenter would say that the experiment requires that you go on. If the teacher kept objecting, um, the experimenter was told to escalate from please continue to the experiment requires that you continue to it's absolutely essential that you continue. And then finally, the experimenter would say that you have no choice, you must go on. Um, so right, the, the teachers administering the shocks, they weren't always happy to do it. Um, and some of them would uh, object, uh, object rather uh, seriously, we, we can't keep doing this. But the experimenter was supposed to tell them, you know, keep going, uh, you should keep going. And the idea here is that the experimenter is an authority figure, right? The experimenter is the one that's running the, the, the test, uh, like running the experiment. Um, you know, they're a, they're a professor at Yale, they're telling the teacher what to do, and the question is how, how long will the teacher continue to listen to the experimenter? Um, if you click on this um, link, you will see, you know, let me actually go in here. Uh, if you, oops, hello. If you click on uh, this link, you can go to the actual Milgram experiment video. Um, this is the original video recorded in the 60s, so you can here you can actually see 
there's the experimenter. Um, this is the subject. Um, this is the learner who, remember, is confederate of the program. So this is the person that they're experimenting on. Um, here's the, uh, here's the uh, experiment machine going up to very strong shock, intense, intense shock, strong intensity shock, extreme intensity shock, danger, severe shock, and then all the way up to triple uh, XXX. Right, so that's very dangerous. Um, they strap the learner into the thing, um, and then they uh, ask them to start reading off. So uh, in this video, and, and again, this is the real experiment. They show several people uh, 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 running this experiment and answering this question. Um, this guy um, immediately says, I'm not going to go on with the experiment. Um, let's see I if I can listen to him a little bit. Well, whether the learner likes it or not, we must go on until he's learned all the word pairs correctly. Well, uh... You can sure have your 450 back. I didn't want it anyhow. I intend to give it to some charitable organization, but I wouldn't go on with it. The 450 is not the uh, issue here. That check is yours simply yeah, going really to the lab. Uh, it is essential that you continue the experiment. No, it isn't essential. Not one bit. You got no other choice, teacher. Oh, I have a lot of choices. My number one choice is that I wouldn't go on if I thought he was being harmed. So this guy is one of the 65% who refuse to go on when the teacher tells him you have no choice, you must go on. Uh, he keeps getting these prods, and the guy's like, no, I'm, I'm not going to keep hurting this guy. Um, in fact, uh, if you watch the video, this is like one of the first or second shocks that he gives, and then he's just like, no, nah, I'm not going to do it. If he's hurting, I'm not going to go continue hurting him. Um, this next guy also uh, refuses to go on. Um, he does it for a little bit, but then he stops. Um, but some of these later people continue going on. This guy in particular, this guy in the white shirt, I strongly recommend you, you watch him. Uh, There's a lot of them here, you know, they love heart condition now. Well, want me to go? Just continue, please. Sh sharp, axe, needle, stick, blade. Answer, please. Wrong. I'm up to 180 volts. Please continue, teacher. Neil, you're gonna get a shot. 180 volts. Oh. I can't stand the pain. Let me out of here. Can't stand it. I'm not gonna kill that man. Eh? You hear him hollering? He's they said before the shocks may be painful, but yeah, they're not but dangerous. They're hollering. He can't stand it. What if something happens to him? The experiment requires that you continue, teacher. Yeah, but uh, I'm not going to get that man sick of that. I mean, he's hollering in there. You know what I mean? I mean, <laughs> he's whether the learner likes it or not, we must go on until well, he's learned I mean, all the uh, words. Uh, I refuse to take the responsibility of getting hurt in there. I'm not. I mean, he's under hollering. It's absolutely essential that you continue, teacher. There's too many left here, and I mean, geez, he go, he gets wrong here. There's too many of them left. I mean, who's going to take the responsibility if anything happens to that gentleman? I'm responsible for anything that happens here. Continue, please. All right, next one. Slow. Walk, dance, truck, music. Answer, please. Wrong. 195 volts. Dance. Let me out of here. Let me out of here. Continue, please. Uh, so uh, this is, uh, it breaks my heart every time I watch it. So this guy goes to the very end, uh, to the final shock, um, after the, the learner has already gone silent, um, and he actually runs through all the questions, and then the uh, experimenter asks him to keep, to go back through the questions again and keep administering the 450 volt shock, and he keeps doing it over and over and over again. Um, uh, the thing I want to point out is that he doesn't like doing this. This guy is not a sadist. He's not, um, he's not someone who enjoys hurting this other gentleman. Um, in fact, you can tell that he's very uh, uh, upset by it. Um, he's holding his head in his hands. He's uh, breathing heavy. He's sighing heavy. Um, he's fighting with the instructor, uh, with the experimenter um, at almost every step. Uh, he, you know, he, he's, he's, switching. he's very clearly not comfortable with what he's doing. Um, Right. He's not hurting this person because he wants to hurt this person. In fact, it's very clear that he doesn't want to hurt this person and uh, that he feels uh, bad and uncomfortable with what he's doing to this person. Nevertheless, he keeps on doing it. Uh, he, he keeps on doing it despite his own feelings about it. 
uh, simply because the experimenter is telling him to do it. Because someone who looks like an authority figure is uh, prodding him to go on. Right? Um, you, you might think like that you're like Dennis Droya and that you have a strong moral code um, and that that's enough to get you through uh, a difficult um, ethical conflict or uh, uh, an, eth an unethical environment. Um, Dennis Roya thought that his own ethical uh, intuitions, his own ethical attitudes, um, were, were good um, and that they were strong enough to keep him uh, acting ethically in a corporate environment. Um, I, I don't think this guy in a white shirt is a bad guy. I don't think he's an unethical guy. In fact, uh, part of what's so painful about watching him here is, is how, uh, how much he doesn't want to do what he's doing, uh, but he does it anyway. Um, there's an interview with him after the experiment uh, where they ask him, you know, why did you keep doing it? Why didn't you, um, why didn't you just refuse to do it? And he says, well, because the experimenter was telling me to do it. I had no choice. He kept telling me to do it. Um, and he didn't see that he himself had an option here. He didn't see that he could have just refused. He thought he had to. He sort of was so uh, gripped by the uh, authority figure telling him what to do that he didn't realize that his own agency and autonomy uh, to, uh, to, to refuse. Right, so the issue is not that he's a bad guy. The issue is not that he doesn't have a moral code. The issue is that his own internal moral code is so easy to override in this context. And again, this isn't like, uh, this is his job. This isn't a career, his career isn't on the line. This is just an experimenter that he met maybe 20 minutes earlier um, uh, to, to volunteer for the experiment for Yale. Um, let's jump back into the presentation. Um, so uh, Milgram Beating's experiment is uh, its a very surprising experiment. It has been repeated since then. Um, it's a, a pretty well-established result. Um, like I said, they don't like to run this experiment anymore because it's traumatic to, to the teacher. Um, the teacher, uh, knowing that they are shocking someone, um, uh, it's, it's, uh, it can be psychologically traumatic uh, for, for, for the teacher. And we, we saw the guy um, sort of holding his hands his head anxious about the, the shocks that he's administering. Um, and, uh, but, but yeah, but th th it's, a, it's a reliable result. Um, the result is very interesting how willing we are to listen to uh, authority figures. Notice that we're much more willing to listen to authority figures than we are to listen to just the crowd. Right? If, if it's just the crowd of our peers, we sometimes listen to them 75% uh, of the time. 75% uh, uh, of the time, I'm sorry, um, at least we'll listen to the group at least, uh, uh, at least once. Um, uh, but uh, in the obedience case, where there's an authority figure, where it's not just your peers, um, more than 65% of the people will listen, listen to it all the way through to the end. Um, the fact that it's an authority figure matters here. Um, if it's just a peer, you won't listen to them. Um, if there's anything that makes that authority figure seem less authoritative, if they're like if they're wearing shorts and uh, 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 like a um, flip flops, um, if they don't look like they're affiliated with any uh, major institution, if they don't look like they're a serious professional, then people won't listen to those authority figures. Um, interestingly, if if you have uh, multiple authority figures, if there's like multiple experimenters and there's disagreement between the experimenters about whether to continue, the teacher will not continue, right? So um, it has to be a unified authority figure uh, to uh, drive this kind of obedience. Um, Milgram obedience experiment is an interesting case. Uh, I strongly recommend you watch the video and you think about uh, some of the cases that it shows in that video. Um. Uh, Milgram himself was motivated to run this experiment um, after reading uh, Hannah Arendt's essays on the Eichmann trial in Jerusalem. So uh, uh, Adolf Eichmann, uh, here you see Adolf Eichmann in the corner, was a, a Nazi officer. Um, he wasn't uh, out in battlefields uh, uh, conducting the war. He was more of a bureaucrat. He was an administrator. Um, but he, uh, he was uh, largely responsible for the administration and uh, sort of the paperwork involved with the Holocaust, uh, with uh, running and maintaining the concentration camps at which uh, millions of people died. Uh, 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 
millions of Jews and uh, people that the Nazis didn't like, uh, homosexuals and so on, uh, 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 were were uh, systematically killed in the Holocaust. Um, one of the horrifying things about um, World War Two and about the Holocaust is, I mean, so uh, war is hell. War has always uh, been terrible, um, and humanity has engaged in war for uh, as, as long as we've been um, uh, agricultural, at least. Um, um, so war is always hell, but what makes World War II especially unique from all the previous wars is that it, it was warfare carried out with sort of industrial scale. It was uh, a, 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 a it was a 20th century war. Um, it was war carried out with the industrial precision of like the manufacturing industry. Um, Jews who were sent to uh, concentration camps um, were often like like numbered uh, with uh, tattooed with numbers or barcodes, and that was because there was a big uh, administrative uh, framework for uh, tracking where all these people were. I mean, you know, in in uh, in some some genocides, it's it's a big band of people with machetes going through villages and just cutting people up, but for the Germans, it was it was done. Uh, with uh, extensive records and bookkeeping, um, the way that you would manage um, a, 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 your, your, the way you'd manage a warehouse, um, and it's this kind of ruthless industrial uh -huh, uh, machinery that makes the Holocaust uh, uh, such a, a large scale and such a terrifying um, event. Um, and uh, Eichmann was one of the people who was engineer engineering it was responsible for its administration. So after so okay so uh, there were um, uh, after the war um, there were a lot of Germans who stayed in Germany during the war um, but weren't particularly attached to the Nazi Party. Um, there was a, a denazification program uh, for for these Germans to follow where there was like a long uh, session of. Uh, sort of a, a, a program for getting people to recognize and discuss and sort of process the extreme uh, horrors of uh, World War II and uh, the responsibility that Germany and the German uh, people had for conducting um, uh, the Holocaust and for doing what they did uh, during World War II. So there's like this uh, recognition and reconciliation uh, program that a lot of Germans went through. Um, a lot of Germans, however, uh, so if you were in directly involved with the Nazi party, though, um, uh, you tended to be uh, arrested or maybe executed. Um, Eichmann was one of these people who was uh, put on trial in Jerusalem, in Israel. Um, people in Israel uh, are not likely to be sympathetic to Eichmann's uh, case. So he wasn't likely to get a very sympathetic trial. Uh, uh, people... Uh, uh, thought that it was uh, perhaps a show trial or was sort of uh, kind of uh, allowed people in Israel to get revenge on the horrors of the Holocaust by holding Eichmann to such a, uh, a public trial. And um, Hannah Arendt, uh, who was a philosopher, um, and uh, she was a Jew in Germany who escaped to Germany and came to uh, New York and uh, uh, got a job as a philosopher teaching at Columbia. Um, uh, and after the war, when the Eichmann trial uh, started, uh, the New Yorker magazine asked Hannah Arendt to go to Jerusalem and cover the trial for the, uh, for the, for the magazine. So I, I believe I have the link to the full article that you can read. Um, she eventually published the essays in a book with some other conversation. Um, and uh, the big media around this trial uh, was set up to frame... Uh, Eichmann as a monster, as um, like a second Hitler, as uh, a terrible human being with a cold, uh, with a cold heart who didn't care anything about humanity, um, and so on. Um, right? This was a this was like an evil evil incarnate. And what Hannah Arendt says in her essays um, is that the the most uh, maybe surprising thing about the trial uh, was that he was he was uh, that he was not a monster, um, that he was in fact a very ordinary person. Um, maybe a little on the shallow uh, or dumb side, um, but uh, very much uh, uh, normal in the way that we think about normal people. Right? Um, you might expect someone who can conduct some uh, horrible thing like the Holocaust to be a, a, a grotesque person, to show in their personality the kind of uh, ethical depravity uh, of their actions. 
But Hennerin says, I was struck by a manifest shallowness in the doer that made it impossible to trace the incontestable evil of his deeds to any deeper level of, of roots or motives. The deeds were monstrous, but the doer, at least a very effective one now in trial, was quite, quite ordinary, commonplace, and neither demonic nor monstrous. There was no sign of him. Uh, there was no sign in him of firm ideological convictions or of specific evil motives. And the only notable characteristic one could detect in his past behavior, as well as in his behavior during the trial and throughout the pretrial uh, police examination, was something entirely negative. It was not stupidity, but thoughtlessness. Um, Eichmann, in the trial, gave uh, what's come to be called the Nuremberg Defense, uh, which is just the defense from superior orders. Let me go back to. Um, the browser here, uh, superior orders, um, is a uh, legal defense for people who are following um, the uh, command of a superior officer or official. It's very common in a military context um, uh, of people who are following their commanding officer. If your commanding officer uh, commands you to commit a war crime, um, uh, for instance, in the United States, uh, maybe the My Lai Massacre uh, is an example of this. So, oops, uh, uh, open a new tab. Oh, here we go. Um, so, yeah, My Lai Massacre is uh, during the Vietnam War. Um, uh, our U.S. troops went into um, a village in Vietnam and uh, killed everyone, sl slaughtered everyone, um, including the women and children. Uh, these people were in innocent victims, um, but the U.S. troops were ordered uh, by a uh, commanding officer. Um, uh, yeah, so that they were uh, they were ordered by their commanding officer to conduct this massacre. It's a, it was a war crime. Um, and uh, uh, so the 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 big um, lesson of superior orders is that it, it's, it doesn't work or it's not supposed to work. Um, during the Nuremberg trials, the Nazi soldiers who were being put on trial um, uh, gave as their defense that they were just following orders. Look, uh, the, the soldier said, um, I wasn't the one who decided what the military should do. I was just a soldier. Uh, when, when my commanding officer tells me to go shoot someone or to go attack a, you know, to go raid a, a village or whatever, I'm just following orders. If I don't follow orders, then I'm being insubordinate. So I just have to, I have to do what um, I'm being told to do. Um, the soldiers aren't the ones who are deciding the military policy for Germany, for the Nazis. Um, that's uh, Hitler and his administration. Um, so the soldiers are saying, it's, it's not my fault. And <coughs> the lesson from the Nuremberg trials is that this doesn't work. Um, in the Nuremberg trials, uh, the Nazi soldiers were found to be responsible for their actions uh, despite the fact of orders. In other words, um, it was established that the soldiers had a responsibility to disobey unlawful or unjust orders. If your superior order is, if your superior officer is telling you to do something that you know to be unjust or unlawful or in violation of uh, ethical obligations, um, then you have an ethical obligation to disobey your orders. You have an ethical obligation to refuse to carry out the task that you were ordered to do. Now, this is uh, difficult, especially in a wartime environment, because if you're insubordinate, that might be taken as uh, a kind of treason. Uh, you might have uh, your life on the line in those cases. Um, uh, but nevertheless, the international uh, standard is that superior, officers, uh, superior orders is not a justification for doing something illegal. If your boss, if your commanding officer is telling you to do something that you know to be illegal, then you have an ethical obligation to refuse to follow that. Um, uh, that order. Uh, Eichmann gives the same justification in his trial, um, and he doesn't seem to recognize that he had other obligations besides just the orders that he was given. Um, Eichmann uh, 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 talks in these trials as if uh, uh, doing the right thing just was following his orders. Like, he thought that that, that was his obligation. Um, he thought that that's uh, what was expected of him. He thought that's what ethics demanded of him. Uh, is to is to follow the orders that he was given, that refusing to follow orders was uh, a kind of disloyalty. It was an insubordination, and that was unethical. But following the orders that he was given was the ethical thing to do. And he he didn't think he had any room to second guess those orders. So again, he he wasn't the one who decided to uh, 
uh, to, 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 to do the Holocaust. Um, he was just the one who admi uh, sort of managed it administratively. Um, and he doesn't recognize that he had an obligation in that situation to, to not do that job, uh, to refuse to do that job, maybe to resist, in other ways, uh, the carrying out of that job. Uh, but he didn't see that obligation. Um, instead, uh, uh, this, so this is why Hannah Arendt is accusing uh, Eichmann of thoughtlessness, that he's, he's not actually thinking. Um, instead, he's appealing to things like cliches, stock phrases, and this is quoting here, cliches, stock phrases, adherence to conventional standardized, standardized codes of expression and conduct, uh, um, uh, these things have the socially, uh, socially recognized function of protecting us against reality, that is, against the claim on our thinking attention that all events and facts make by virtue of their existence. If we were responsive to this claim all the time, we would soon be exhausted. Eichmann differed from the rest of us only in that he, cl that he clearly knew of no such claim at all. Um, I, uh, Hannah Arendt describes Eichmann uh, with the phrase, uh, the banality of evil. Let me see. Um, yeah, the banality of evil. Um, the argument here is that, or the, the claim, so uh, banal, uh, so something is banal, the, the word banal uh, just means ordinary or commonplace. It means uninteresting. And when we talk about evil, you know, evil, uh, if anything, evil is interesting, right? Evil seems interesting. It seems like it's hard to not be, not compelled by evil, but just uh, to, to find the things... Uh, uh, evil, you might think, is not commonplace, not ordinary. And uh, Hannah Arendt says, uh, talks about the banality of evil, uh, that Eichmann, as an example of the banality of evil, that in fact Eichmann is very uh, common, very or ordinary, very uh, very commonplace. Um, um, uh, in, in the sense that any of us could have been, so like uh, any of us could have been Eichmann. Um, um, Eichmann had the position that he had in the Nazi. Uh, organization uh, because he was listening to the orders that were given to him and uh, by listening to those orders he was positively reinforced right he rose the ranks he got his promotions uh, because he was doing what he was told right so all of the reinforcement that he was given uh, was telling him that he was doing the right thing and if any of us were in the situation where we were also fed that kind of reinforcement perhaps we're also capable of doing something uh, uh, of, of great evil um, not because we ourselves are evil but because we're just normal people, and normal people put in evil situations will do evil things. So uh, if we have this sort of comic book uh, figure of evil, like the Mr. Burns finger steeple cackling maniacally while lightning bolts crash behind behind him, like, like stroking his cat or something, right? that's the sort of comic book evil that we sometimes see in the movies or that we might think about uh, when we're thinking about evil. Um, and uh, it's very easy for us to say, oh, we're not that kind of evil. Right? I'm not Mr. Burns. I don't deliberately want people to be hurt. Um, I'm not maliciously trying to take advantage of other people. Um, but if evil is not the comic book evil, and instead evil is the sort of banal everyday evil of, uh, of, a, of a bureaucrat in an evil organization, um, then, uh, then maybe uh, we're all capable of that great, great evil, and maybe it's a lot harder to spot and it's a lot harder to prevent um, than where than we take take credit for, right? When you're in a large organization, this is from Office Space. If you're in a large organization, uh, maybe you just feel like a cog in the machine, and that you have no real agency to do uh, to do anything in those organizations, um, or or maybe you think that your agency is so narrow as to uh, be powerless uh, to, to to resist evil. Um, but everyone working in an evil organization helps that organization conduct its evil. Um, uh, and every one of those people have the ability, um, the, 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 sh the raw capacity to refuse orders, to say, no, I'm not going to do that. It might be hard. Uh, it might come at great consequence, and we'll see when we talk about whistleblowing, uh, the, some of the consequences for resisting um, orders. Uh, in, in a professional environment. But maybe you have some obligation to face those consequences, to accept those consequences, um, and resist doing great evil. Um, thinking along these lines, um, I also have an article in the optional readings um, from Eric Katz, uh, who is currently the chair of the Humanities Department at NGIT. Um, and he teaches this engineering ethics course quite, quite often. And uh, he wrote this article. Uh, uh, his research is on... Um, uh, uh, Nazi technology, um, or at least part of his research interest is in 
uh, uh, Nazi technology and the sort of technological uh, and the ethical uh, implications of the uh, Nazi technology. And so he wrote this short paper on Nazi engineers on what the ethics are of working in a evil organization like in, like the engineers who work for the Nazis. And he's, he talks about several uh, cases of these. Um, one particular case that I want to uh, focus on is the case of Albert Speer. Um, Albert Speer was an architect by training, and he eventually rose to the ranks to be Hitler's um, armaments minister, so a very high-ranked official in Hitler's administration. Um, he was, in fact, the highest-ranked Nazi who was not killed either during the war or during execution afterwards. Um, and that means that he was able to write his memoirs in the 1970s and talk at, in some length about... Uh, his reflections on being involved in the uh, Nazi regime, um, the decisions that he made, um, the sort of ethics of his position. Um, I'm, I, I haven't read his memoirs myself, I just know from uh, Dr. Katz's uh, article, but uh, um, uh, it's not clear how apologetic he is from his discussion, um, in particular of, about his role in helping the, uh, uh, the, the Nazi regime. Uh, in his memoirs, he uh, makes an argument that his uh, contributions uh, were non-political. He says that the task I have to fulfill, uh, in a letter to Hitler, uh, he says uh, that the task I have to fulfill is an unpolitical one. I felt at ease in my work uh, so long as my person and my work were evaluated solely by the standard of practical accomplishments. So he's, he's in Hitler's administration. Right? He's helping to engineer um, the war effort uh, for Nazi Germany. Nevertheless, he wants to say that his actions are not political um, and that his work should be judged based on the merits of his accomplishments, like the practical accomplishments. Like, did he actually build something that works? Right? Was his administration successful? As opposed to uh, any of the other ethical uh, uh, standards we might hold his work to. And uh, in this article, uh, Eric Katz um, says that Spears... Uh, justification here is a form of technological neutrality. Right? What, what, he, what he's saying is that uh, I, I'm just doing the technical work. I'm not doing anything political or ethical, so you should evaluate me by whether my technical work was successful and not about the ethics and politics of my work. M meanwhile, he's going around helping the Nazi war effort. So uh, what Eric Kass wants to say is that, look, this kind of work is inherently political, and it has an inherent ethical valence, and it's uh, a, m a mistake to think that uh, we can divorce the technical competence from the ethical and political uh, justification. Um, uh, you, I mean, you might you might do this in a couple of ways. So, uh, so uh, Spear is, is arguing for a kind of technological neutrality that his that his technique should be evaluated independently of its ethics. And uh, one of the implications of this way of reasoning. Um, which Dr. Katz discusses in the article, um, is that it, it makes it seem like um, that it makes it seem like that in order to be responsive to the ethics and politics of a situation, um, you have to uh, get outside or even rebel against the standards of, of the profession, the technical standards of the profession, right? So, so the the implication of Albert Speer's uh, sort of neutrality argument here is that there's the standards of the profession, and then there's all these ethical and political standards. Um, and that if, if you want to talk about ethical and political standards, then you've sort of given up on the technical standards and vice versa. Um, so uh, 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 a legal scholar named Jack Sammons uh, discusses this kind of argument as a uh, professional rebel argument, that you have to rebel against your professional role, you have to rebel against the standards of your profession in order to have some um, ethical or political uh, stance. Um. And this is supposed to explain why Albert Speer wants to say that, no, it's not an ethical political thing, it's, it's a technical thing. So he wants to sort of make that division and then uh, claim that he's only on one side of that division. Um, and uh, uh, Jack Sammons and Dr. Katz uh, say that the solution is not to uh, insist on the distinction between the technical and the ethical political, uh, but it's, it's instead to realize that those ethics and politics are an inherent part of the professional role that there's no separate technical, uh, there's no technical sphere that's separate from the political sphere, but that the technical sphere includes the political sphere and the political sphere includes the technical sphere uh, at the same time. Um, these things are not separate. Um, 
So quoting from Katz, he says, uh, A spear did not fail as a moral person because he failed to rebel against his professional role. Rather, he failed as a moral person because he failed in his professional role as an architect. Um, right. So uh, it wasn't that he did his professional role and, and failed ethics. It's that he failed his professional role because his professional role includes those ethical considerations. Dr. Katz continues, uh, it is this deeper integration with one's professional role that can provide a person with the moral resources to resist the evil practices of technology. So really identifying um, not just with the technical aspects of the role, but also with the um, ethical and political aspects of your professional role as engineers um, is how you maybe resist this kind of evil. Okay, that's a whole lot of heavy stuff. Um, I, the final thing I have is this first follower video, um, which I love a lot. It's very short. It's just a few minutes. Um, I encourage you to watch it on your own. Um, this is about, uh, it's a short video that shows how movements start. Um, I've talked a lot of, in this lesson. Um, I'm actually not going to show you the video because I, I want to save this surprise for you. But let me put myself back on camera. Yeah. So, um, here. Uh, so I've... I've uh, talked a lot to this lesson about the problems with conformity and obedience, how conformity and obedience makes, maybe makes us make bad decisions or unethical decisions or uh, advances uh, corporate interests at, our, at the expense of our own values and interests. Um, but I don't want to make it seem like conformity and obedience are always a bad thing. Um, on the contrary, being able to follow others, being able to coordinate as a group, especially with uh, group members that uh, you, don't, you don't already know. Um, this is vitally important for all human social activity. Um, we can't be social creatures without at least some capacity to follow scripts, to follow others, uh, to conform to social standards, um, to follow authority figures. Um, so I, I don't want to say that these things are wrong, and this first follower video is supposed to give you an example of how... Uh, 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 Following how conformity and obedience can be a good thing, in fact, can be a very positive thing. Um, so uh, think about these things uh, as you're going through the readings, uh, as you're uh, answering your uh, quiz and you're writing your essay. Um, good luck with it all, uh, and I'm looking forward to seeing your essays, uh, and I'll talk to you uh, in lesson five.